Shalom. I'm David Yah. Right now we're going to look at Contending for Truth. Dot com, pharmacia, sorcery, pharmaceuticals, and the roots of modern day drug, part one, by Dr. Scott Johnson, September twenty first, two thousand eight. Pharmacia, sorcery, pharmaceuticals, and the roots of modern day drug, part one, nine twenty one, and nine twenty eight, two thousand eight. Pharmakia is a form of the Greek root word for which we get our English words pharmacy, pharmacist, and pharmaceutical. In the scriptures, pharmakia carried with it the idea of sorcery, occultism, and black magic. It is in this sense that Paul used the term in Galatians 5.20 as the word witchcraft in Revelation 9.21 and 1823, it is translated sorceries. Do you find it rather disturbing that approximately 60% of the population is taking at least one pharmaceutical drug every day? Some are taking up to 15 and 20. We are told that we are living during a time of the greatest medical breakthroughs in the history of the world, yet over 100 million Americans suffer from various health problems. Why has such a large majority of the world become dependent on pharmaceutical drugs? Perhaps you're one of the hundreds of millions around the world that's ingesting a daily dose of pharmaceutical medicine. Is it possible that the pharmaceutical slash medical cartel has disease treatment and not disease cure in mind? The most powerful German economic corporate emporium in the first half of this century was known as IG Farben and was nothing more than a powerful cartel of BASF, Bayer, Heuscht, and other German chemical and pharmaceutical companies. IGF, rather IG Farben, was the single largest donor to the election campaign of Adolf Hitler and the beginning of the modern day pharmaceutical industry. Zyklon B, an extermination gas, produced by Heuscht, was used to kill millions of innocent people in death camps. The U.S. government, rather, the U.S. government's investigation of all the factors leading to World War II in 1946 came to the conclusion that without I.G. Farben, the Second World War would have not been possible. We're going to go ahead and click here to listen to the one hour and six minute and 40 second podcast. Enjoy. We'd like to welcome you to our current event and weekly Bible study for 92108. And we'll be starting a new teaching today on the subject of the word pharmakia, sorcery and witchcraft. And in essence, we're going to be discussing the foundational meaning of the words pharmacy, pharmacist, and pharmaceutical. Now, we're going to take this into a study on the whole medical profession, really the pharmaceutical industry, I should say. We're going to look at the roots of the pharmaceutical industry because if the foundations be destroyed, what can the righteous do? According to Psalm 11, verse 3, and this is what we're going to be endeavoring to do today. Now, pharmakia is actually a form of the Greek root word, which is where we get our English words, pharmacy, pharmacist and pharmaceutical okay the word pharmakia in the new testament pharmakia carries it with with it the idea of sorcery occultism and black magic it is in this sense that paul used this exact term in galatians 5:20 as the word witchcraft where we where we read in uh, the works of the flesh in galatians 5:20 idolatry witchcraft hatred variance emulations wrath strife seditions heresies so the word pharmakia is actually translated into the word witchcraft in Galatians 5.20. Uh, Strong's definition of pharmakia is that, number one, the several definitions, the use or administering of drugs. Number two, poisoning. Three, sorcery or magical arts often found in connection with idolatry and fostered by it. 
uh, for the deceptions and seductions of idolatry. This is this is the whole context of the word pharmakia. In Vine's expository dictionary, it's listed as the word for sorcery or pharmacy is what they're saying. English pharmacy is really the word for sorcery. <laughs> so, and then it's primarily signified the use of medicine, drugs, spells, poisoning, sorcery. It's used in Galatians 5.20. Uh, it's also used in Revelation 9.21, 18.23, Exodus 11, uh, Exodus 7, 11 and 22, Exodus 8, 7 and 18, Isaiah 47, 9 and 12. We're going to be looking at some of those verses because um, we want to look exactly where is pharmakia translated in the Bible, okay? It's also used uh, in sorcery, the use of drugs, whether simple or potent, was generally accompanied by incantations and appeals to occult powers, with the provision of various charms, amulets, etc. Now, again, you know, where the Bible talks about fleeing all appearance of evil, well, you know, you, you want to take a, a pretty good look at this because th this is, there's a lot of evil connected with the word pharmakia. Okay? Pharmakia is also used as the word for sorcery in this verse. Acts 8 9. But there was a certain man called Simon, which before time in the same city used sorcery and bewitched the people of Samaria, giving out that himself was some great one. Okay, now, that's Acts 8 9. The word for sorcery there is translated from the word pharmakia. Okay, so Simon, you know, the wizard, he was using sorcery. Now, again, the sorcery probably encompassed the use of mind-altering drugs. Okay, that was probably one of the tenets of the witchcraft he was using. It's no different than it is today. The same thing. It's well known that within witchcraft, one of the main ways that you can open yourself up to the demonic realm is through the use of mind-altering drugs or substances because you're opening doorways, okay? The demons can come in easier. Your inhibitions go down. You will, you will do things that you normally wouldn't do under the influence of mind-altering drugs, right? Well, that's exactly the reason they're so promoted and used within witchcraft. And then in Revelation 9.21, it says, Neither repented they of their murders, nor of their sorceries, nor of their fornication, nor of their thefts. So sorceries, again here, is translated in Revelation 9.21 from the word pharmakia. And then we go to Revelation 18.23. Uh, speaking of the end-time, whorish, satanic city of Babylon, we read, in the, light of the, of, in the light of a candle shall shine no more at all in thee, and the voice of the bridegroom and of the bride shall no more be heard at all in thee. For thy merchants were the great men of the earth. For by thy sorceries, pharmakia, were all nations deceived. Now this is one of the main things that the Bible talks about in the end times. That by the sorceries of the great whore city of Babylon were all nations deceived. And in that particular vein, the word sorceries is, is translated from the word pharmakia. Now, every time the word witchcraft is translated in the Bible, it's not always pharmakia. It's not always translated from that root word. But in these instances, it was. It used the word pharmakia. And I believe it did so for a reason. That's an interesting point to understand there. What is pharmakia connected with the administering of drugs, poisoning, sorcery, magical arts, deception, idolatry. But this is a big deal. Exodus 7, 11, and 12 says, Then Pharaoh, also called the wise men and the sorcerers, which is translated from pharmakia, the sorcerers, now the magicians of Egypt, they did also in like manner with their enchantments, for they cast down every man his rod, and they became serpents. But Aaron's rod swallowed up their rods. Okay, so again, that's just, just some background there on this particular word that we can build as a foundation on this teaching. This is an excerpt from an article entitled Church Witchcraft, and goes on to say, the Bible calls witchcraft the spirit of rebellion, but another excellent definition is whatever attempts to exert an unnatural degree or type of influence or control over a person. Consider, for instance, that drugs and alcohol are often used in witchcraft rites. If a driver is drunk or high and the police catches him, what is he charged with? Driving under the influence. Addicts to drugs and alcohol are often said that they are under the control of them. Even in these cartoonish depictions of witches, what are they seen doing? Casting spells to alter someone's natural desired state or to get someone to act in a manner against their own wishes, but in accordance with the wit wishes of the witch. 
Okay, these are just things to go over. Now remember, the Bible says for rebellion as is the sin of witchcraft. Okay, so again, the, the, this pharmakia and the whole thing is tied in with witchcraft. And rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft. And it goes on to say, in any event, things like hypnosis and mind control are actual forms of witchcraft. And yes, that includes a lot of what is currently called psychology or psychiatry. Well, you know, psychiatry has the highest suicide rate of any, of any doctor profession that there is. What do they deal with? Mind-altering drugs all day long. Oh, you have this problem. I'm going to prescribe you this drug. And it's, going to make, it's not going to take the demons away. It's not going to do that. You're, you're, you're trying to do something that only Jesus Christ himself can do, okay? And you can't do it. You cannot drug your body into good health. It's impossible. Let's go further. Um, the psychology and psychiatry says trying to get you to either live in agreement. This is what psychology and psychiatry do, try to do. They try to get you to either live in agreement with the demons that are inside you. Or they try to get you to overcome the demons in you and the more stronger demons. That is what those exceedingly powerful antipsychotic drugs are for, to get bigger and better demons to suppress your lesser demons. It's an interesting way of looking at things, but there's a lot of validity to what they're saying because you're dealing with demonic problems and you're doing it through mind-altering drugs or pharmakia. How does that make sense from a biblical standpoint? I just, I can't see it. Let me tell you, if it were not the... If you were not crazy before you took that stuff, you'd be crazy afterwards because the demons that are in those antipsychotic drugs attract and will make it so. In other words, they open doorways just like all mind-altering drugs do. Again, you take these, these um, drugs, this pharmacia, these mind-altering ones in particular, you can open doorways and you're going to have to deal with worse things. Now, you may feel better for a time. Okay, the bigger demons come into you and they suppress the littler ones that were giving you problems and you feel better for a time. But then the bill comes due and these these more powerful demons start to manifest inside you. And now you've got a bigger problem than you ever had them before you started. Okay, then you have to take more of the same drug to keep suppressing it or alter prescriptions or, you know, it never ends. They all have side effects to boot. But you know how many people in the churches are on these types of drugs? And they think nothing of it, and their pastor says nothing about it, as though, oh, she needs her medications. I don't recall in Jesus' time, or when the apostles were around, or even in the Old Testament, where, there, where it ever says, yes, thou shalt take thy meds to, to make thee well. This is what will heal thy mind. I'm sorry, I don't see that anywhere in the Bible. I don't see any biblical precedence for it. A lot of times people say, yeah, well, I'm doing this and I'm doing that. And I immediately think, is there any biblical precedence we see? Is there any biblical precedence where we could go in the New Testament and say, yeah, you know what? They were doing the same thing. I just, I don't see it. But what we do see is this word pharmakia translated into the word witchcraft and sorcery and the Bible continually warning about this. Warning over and over again about this. So again, are you, are you going to err on the side of safety? So going back to the article, it says, but when you think about it, the spirit of drug-induced control is rebellion against God's plan. We are supposed to be under God's authority. God is sovereign and we should have free will to accept God's sovereignty in every area of our life or to reject it. Of course, God has an organizational structure such as the pastor being the head of the church and the man being the head of the family, but those things are created by God so God is still in control, especially if the good man of the house or the pastor of the church submits himself to God's divine authority in all matters. This next article is from uh, the Crusader magazine. It's entitled, Beware of the Sorcerer's Medicine by Greg Ciola. And uh, I'll try to make all this available in a PDF format for you in, in the teaching. And it says, do you find it rather disturbing that approximately 60% of the population is taking at least one pharmaceutical drug every day? 60% of the population taking one pharmaceutical drug every day. Most people wouldn't think anything of it. They just think it's the way it should be. You know, I can drug my body into good health. It is possible. You're, you're putting something in your body on a daily basis that is a controlled poison. All drugs are controlled poisons. You know how I can prove it? Take a whole bottle of whatever you're taking and see what happens. I'm not telling you to do that. I'm saying if you did, most of the time it'll kill you. Even a whole bottle of aspirin will do that. Okay, that's how you know it's a controlled poison. You take a little too much of it, you know, 
You eat too many bananas, it's not going to kill you. You know, you eat too much health food or whatever, it's not going to kill you like a drug will. Some are taking up to 15 to 20 meds every day, and I, and I know that's true. We are, we are told that we are living during a time of the greatest medical breakthroughs in the history of the world, yet over 100 million Americans suffer from various health problems. Why has such a large majority of the world become dependent on pharmaceutical drugs? If medical science was cracked up to what it claims to be, we should be witnessing medical cures on an unprecedented level. Perhaps you're one of the hundreds of millions of people around the world that's ingesting a daily dose of pharmaceutical medicine. Is it possible that the pharmaceutical medical cartel has disease treatment and not disease cure in mind? See, that's what it's all about. It's about, it's about disease, not really even treatment. It's about really controlling the disease and thus propagating the disease so that they can continue to make profits off the disease. Why is there never a cure for anything ever invented? Why is that? Because if they invented a cure for cancer, and there's multiple cures for cancer, natural ones, but if they invented a cure for cancer, then the oncology field is gone, basically. All it would be is about curing it. Or, or prevention of cancer. If they invented a cure, oh, you know, Jerry's kids, we're gonna we're gonna get a cure for for uh, muscular dystrophy any day. They do that that stupid telethon every year, and they raise all those millions and millions that go straight back into the coffers of the pharmaceutical companies and the medical. They're never gonna they're never going to invent a cure if it's left up to them. Why? Because it's how they make their living and their money. Pharmaceutical companies are a for-profit venture traded on the public stock market, and they're out to make as much money as possible. And the greed is unlike just about any other area on the planet. They make some drugs that they make for pennies and literally sell them into close to $1,000. Some of these profit margins are so obscene. In fact, I should have I should have hit on that. I have hit on that on many of my previous emails. I have a couple different email list. One's a health and one's a Christian. And uh, if you want on either one of them, just email me and let me know. But um, these, the, the profit margins are just unbelievable on most of the drugs that are out there. The unmitigated greed behind them. And then the fact that all drugs have side effects, which either means that you got to take more of the, of the drug or you got to take other drugs to counteract these side effects. They're all toxic to the liver. Okay, the liver is the chief site in the body where toxins are broken down. There's two enzyme pathways in the liver, cytochrome P450, phase one and phase two enzyme pathways. Okay, all drugs gum up that pathway, essentially. They, they kind of shut it down. And when you cannot detoxify poisons out of your body, carcinogenic compounds get into the bloodstream and set you up for cancer. Or who knows what else, autoimmune system processes. It would be like... It would be like, um, you know, having an oil filter that was totally gummed up in your car and never replacing it. And that's why I do recommend cleansing, you know, of the liver and the colon and these types of things. We're being bombarded with more chemicals and more things now than we've ever been bombarded with in the history of mankind. It's a proven fact. According to Environmental Protection Agency, we're exposed over, uh, I believe it's over 75,000 chemicals on a daily basis, potentially, potentially. And of those, the vast majority are carcinogenic or cancer-causing. So these are things that, that um, are greatly interfering with our bodily processes. And yet there's very, very little press about it because the people that control the media and the newspapers and these types of things are typically heavily invested or a lot of times sponsored by the pharmaceutical companies and these things. We're going to be taking a really good in-depth look at the pharmaceutical companies and uh, seeing what they're really, really all about. And if they're really about getting you better and getting you well. This goes on to say, in this groundbreaking article, we're going to peel the veneer of lies away from the subject and attempt to expose the pharmaceutical industry for what it really is. This is one of the largest industries in the world with annual sales into the hundreds of billions of dollars. The sad part is, is that it has been around, it is built on the backs of people who are sick, diseased, and dying. In this greedy, power-driven world, er eradicating disease is not on the list of priorities with the medical establishment. See, it's built on the backs 
are the people that are sick, diseased, and dying. It's not about getting them better. It's about getting them addicted to these medicines and controlling them. And here's what happens. Here's another thing that happens. Get somebody on meds. Let's say they come in and they've got, let's, for example, say heart problems. Well, let's get them on the litany of meds for the heart problems, okay? And then as they're doing this, all the while, more and more plaque is building up in the arteries until finally that artery goes close and they have a heart attack or a CVA, Okay, a cardiovascular accident or a stroke or something like that. A piece of plaque breaks off, goes into the brain. Okay, they've got them on all these meds. And then what the meds did is they swept the symptoms of the plaque into the arteries under the rug long enough until they would actually have the heart attack. Now they've got to have surgery because they've swept the symptoms under the rug for so long that now they're a surgical candidate. And that's what the, that's what the meds typically do. They treat symptoms. As though symptoms are something evil. Symptoms are, it's like, oh, my body's so stupid, it's giving me these symptoms. That's how we treat our bodies. Because, hey, I got this symptom, and, and I got this chest pain. I'll just take angina, or I'll take uh, nitroglycerin to treat the chest pain. The reason the chest pain's there is because your arteries are getting so plaqued up that you're getting lack of blood flow or oxygen to the heart muscle. Now the heart muscle's starting to ache or cramp. That's why you're getting the chest pains. The nitroglycerin temporarily opens that pathway up, but it doesn't fix anything. What's the solution? Well, the solution for that would be something like the enzyme natokinase, which is an enzyme you can take. It's called a systemic enzyme. You take it on an empty stomach. It actually cleans out the arteries. You can do EDT chelation. Now, I don't even advocate the uh, intravenous kind because it's so expensive. 150 bucks a pop, two-hour session, 30 to 50 sessions. You're looking at four to five to six thousand dollars. Just do the EDTA oral chelation that you can buy online anywhere. And you do a couple capsules under your tongue at night before bed. Do about 1,000 milligrams a day. Do it with some natokinase. Clean your arteries out that way. Lecithin does that too. Lecithin helps to clean out the arteries. It helps to defat the liver and, and the, uh, the fat or the placking of the arteries. Um, phosphorus does that to a certain extent. It helps to take calcium deposits out of the arteries. There's a lot of different things where you can accomplish this. Now, the medical solution is put them on meds until they have the heart attack, sweep the symptoms under the, under the rug, and then when we'll do the surgery. We'll make thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars, and we'll look like we're really smart because we're surgeons, and we can go in there and we can um, put a stint in. It's It's ridiculous. Think about this. If you've got your arteries plaqued up, and I'm, I'm just giving this as one example today, okay? I'm not going to go into every little example. I'm giving this as one example of the fallacy of medicine, okay? You put a stint in after a heart attack. You've got this, all these fatty plaques. They find this one area where it got so bad that the blood flow couldn't even get through. You put a stint, which is a little thing that reroutes the blood. And then the stint's there, and what's going to happen? Well, the same thing's going to happen. You haven't done anything to fix the problem. You've got hundreds of miles of blood vessels in your body, and they're plaqued up too. You've treated one little tiny area. You've done nothing to treat the problem. Now you're back on your meds again, sweeping the symptoms under the rug. What have you done to correct anything? Oh, well, it wasn't that. It was my carotid arteries. I had them go in there and scrape my carotid arteries out. Well, that's, that's all well and good, but you know what? What about the other hundreds of miles of blood vessels? Have you fixed the problem? No. The things that I'm talking about that I just mentioned, they actually correct the problem. So that you don't need the surgery and you don't need the drugs. Am I saying you're treating them? No, I can't say that. Because you can't say that unless you wear a white coat and, and have an MD next to your name. Okay? But if you supply your body with the right tools, it can do amazing things. That's the point I'm trying to make. Okay? God didn't create us with drug deficiencies. Well, I have chronic headaches. That must mean I have a chronic Tylenol deficiency. That's not how God created us. Okay, He didn't create us with drug deficiencies. I don't have any problem with emergency medicine to save a life. Okay, Or sometimes, yes, there's extenuating circumstances and pharmaceuticals may be the only way to control something. Okay, I'm not talking about the extenuating circumstances. I'm talking about 60% of the population being on at least one medication in America. And it's all by design. So if we go further... In this greedy, power-driven world, eradicating disease is not on the list of priorities with the medical establishment. Control of disease is. That is why we have a branch of government called the Center for Disease Control. Notice that it wasn't named the Centers for Disease Cures. 
Where would all these multinational corporations turn to replace their soaring profits if disease were being cured? How do you think the international stock markets would react if these companies suddenly saw their sales plummet because people no longer required expensive drugs that are driving many to complete poverty? Think about this. The people that own these drug companies, and we're going to look at this in depth, they are as evil of people, or, or whatever they are, they are as evil of an organization or people that we have on the planet, okay? Many of these are absolutely and totally interlinked in with the highest echelons of the Illuminati, the occult, the establishment, the global elite, whatever you want to call them. They're the ones that are producing these things. And you want to entrust them with your health? The very people that want to see you wiped off the planet? It doesn't make a whole lot of sense to me. If pharmaceutical drugs were truly the answer to our medical maladies, where are the success stories? Sure, the media and the medical establishment can zero in on a few remarkable cases. The charade won't work if they didn't at least have that. But in the big picture, modern medicine has been a complete failure. Instead of all the wonderful success stories, we hear about horror stories of medical malpractice, overdosing, terrible side effects, and in some cases even death. Then the but the media doesn't want you to know about these typically. Just take a walk in any hospital or nursing home to see for yourself what the so-called medical panacea has done. Many of the people in these institutions are like zombies because they're being pumped full of powerful drugs. After visiting one of these establishments, you'll probably question whether these great promises that are held out are really true. Is this what we in the West call medical advancement? Modern medical medicine is ruining more lives than it claims to be helping, and it has turned countless numbers of people into pharmaceutical junkies. Now, I'm going to read this little article that was in the paper here locally this week, and it was entitled, now this, is, this was in our paper, so there is some truth out there. This was from uh, September 14th, um, and it was entitled, it's from the Associated Press, can't accuse me of being biased here, Drug Firms Get a Bitter Pill to, bitter Pills to Swallow. And in Trenton, New Jersey, just about every every segment of the medical community is piling on, well, actually, this was written in Trenton, New Jersey, but this applies to all America. Just about every segment of the medical community is piling on the pharmaceutical industry these days, accusing drug makers of deceiving the public, manipulating doctors, and putting profits before patients. Recent articles and editorials in major medical journals blast the industry, medical schools, teaching hospitals, and physician groups are changing the rules to limit the influence of pharmaceutical sales representatives and three top editors of the prestigious New York Journal of Medicine last month publicly cited against the drug industry in a U.S. Supreme Court case over whether patients harmed by government approved medicines may still sue the state in courts. Now, even the medical establishment, it's gotten so flagrant, so out of control, even many in the medical establishment are coming against them. Okay, now remember, what did I start out this teaching today defining? We define the word pharmakia, which is where we get the root word for pharmacy, uh, pharmaceuticals, and these types of things. If we have defined that root word as being evil and having to do with witchcraft and sorcery, might we expect to see some evil things associated with this very profession. And that's all I see, essentially. Okay, let's go further. The influence that the pharmaceutical companies, the, the for-profits, are having on every aspect of medicine is so blatant now that you'd have to be deaf, blind, and dumb not to see it. Who said that? The Journal of American Medicine Association editor, Dr. Catherine DeAngelis, a longtime industry critic. It's not a chiropractor saying it. <laughs> this is the this is the Journal of American Medical Association. Dr. Catherine DeAngelis said this. This she goes on to say we have just allowed them to take over, and it's our fault. The whole medical community manipulation of the studies and the publications by pharmaceutical and medical device industries is either increasing or there has been more exposure of these practices, she wrote. She said industry influence includes swaying doctors and medical students to their brands with gifts, funding research at top teaching hospitals, but keeping control of the studies and the results. See, so much of the time, if we see the result of a study, it's because it's been bought and paid for by some private pharmaceutical group. And do you think that the, the study's not going to be biased? <laughs> it has to be biased. They bought and paid for the study. They're not going to police themselves, that's for sure. So that obviously brings us into the whole conflict of interest. 
uh, even taking over the continuing edu- uh, they've even taken over the continuing medical education system for doctors by running courses on new treatments so you can imagine the pharmaceutical industries uh, offering the doctors what they call their CEUs their continuing education uh, I have to get 40 hours of CEUs every two years to maintain my license here where, where I'm at as a chiropractor and the medical doctors have to do something very similar well, can, you can imagine it's just they're being bombarded they've got their pharmaceutical sales reps coming in brainwashing them that way They've been brainwashed in college, and now they've got their CEUs being sponsored by the pharmaceutical companies. Critics say such courses are taught by company-paid speakers who often promote expensive new drugs over the older, cheaper ones. That's what it's all about. It's always about money. The love of money is the root of all evil, and that has everything to do with what we're talking about today. It is possible that there is it possible that there's a darker side to pharmaceutical medicine. I think we've already proved that, but we're going to way more proof it uh, coming up here. Could it be that the pharmaceutical industry represents an ancient priesthood that practices sorcery and witchcraft on an unwitting populace? Oh, now, now I've crossed the line saying that. Well, we'll see if I've crossed the line. In search of these answers, I spent countless hours doing painstaking research. Now, remember, this is Greg Sciola writing this article. Okay, I'm going to be interjecting along the way, but I, I read this and I thought it was very accurate. In search of these answers, I spent countless hours doing painstaking research to get to the bottom of this. What I discovered was truly amazing. The evidence is there for all who are searching for the truth. The first place I began to search for my answers was in the Bible. As a Bible student, I felt that there must be a deeper message relating to this subject. Some of the most shocking and convincing evidence that unlocked what I was looking for came from two words, sorcery and witchcraft, in which the 18th chapter of the book of Revelation, for instance, it deals with the whore of Babylon and her eventual destruction. Verse 23 is what really caught my attention. And again, uh, we, we read this earlier, but it says, For by thy sorceries were all nations deceived. Translated sorceries from the word pharmakia. I thought to myself, that's a pretty interesting statement. What is this passage trying to say? I took out my concordance, looked up the derivation of the word sorcery, practically fell off my chair when I found out that it comes from the Greek word pharmakia. The definition of the definition the concordance gives for this word is medication, magic, sorcery, and witchcraft. The very next word in the Greek is pharmakis, which is derived from pharmakion. The word means a drug or spell-giving potion, a druggist, a pharmacist, or a poisoner, a magician, or a sorcerer. You know, it's funny, I drive by, they got this these new signs on, on, on the Walgreens, I don't know if you've seen those, and it has this little pestle and this little uh, a pestle and a mortar or something it's it's the thing that you take the little uh, it's like a stone thing and, and it's this little cup and you can grind up herbs and stuff like that in it and it's got these little stars shooting out of the top like you like you're dealing with magic and you are but see it's all candy coated it's all this big veneer and that we've had you know we've literally had the wool pulled, pulled over our eyes in regard to this particular subject The vast majority of business that these places like uh, in America, like Walgreens or CVS Pharmacy, the vast majority of the reasons that their doors are open is not to sell.